expedition in Mongolia. <laughs> Professor Samya, a bear researcher, and his student Yondon venture into one of the most remote regions of the world, the Gobi Desert. <laughs> a world that's breathtakingly beautiful, yet extremely hostile. Watering holes scattered far apart make for islands of life. The biologists are on the trail of the desert's most mysterious inhabitant. Flattened grass and paw prints from last night. Professor Samya and Yondon are right on its heels, and its droppings are still fresh. They are on the trail of the Gobi bear. Very few people have ever seen one, some say it's only a myth, but photo traps provide the proof. The legendary desert bears do actually exist. Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, an up-and-coming metropolis in the steppe. The expedition starts out from the National University. At the age of 62, Professor Samya could already have gone into retirement. For the Gobi bear, however, he's glad to stick around for another couple of years. Yondon is close to getting her master's degree in biology. Ever since she saw the first pictures of the bear from the photo trap, She's been quite enthusiastic in her support for Professor Samya. For the Mongolians, the Gobi bear is something that's very special, one of the last great wild animals of the desert. And it can only be found here. It's kind of a national symbol. That's why we're calling for the protection of the Gobi bear, to make sure it doesn't die out. <laughs> The road ahead of us is rough. We could also drive out with fancy Japanese jeeps, with air conditioning and all the bells and whistles. But if they get stranded in the desert, we'll have a real problem. Our Russian jeeps are robust workhorses. They don't have superfluous electronics. If they break down, even a nomad could repair them. <laughs> <laughs> Before them lies a distance of a good 1,200 kilometers. There's only asphalt on the roads for the first day. At the gates of the city, an old ritual. Go clockwise around the Ovu three times and leave a few stones, which calms the steppe's ghosts and brings a person luck on their journey. We continue through the steppe, home of the nomads, the traditional way of life of the herdsmen, going from pasture to pasture with their herds of sheep and goats still exists here even though most Mongolians now live in cities and settlements. After leaving the capital, the route heads to the foothills of the Altai Mountains first, and then takes a turn towards the desert. The refuge of the last Gobi bears is located just before the Chinese border. If all goes well, it will take four days to arrive at their destination. Everyone has a tent. There's a gas cooker for noodle soup and a satellite telephone for emergencies. That's the extent of the luxuries. But there's still a program for the evening. Up in the region of the Bears, a doctoral student has been monitoring a dozen photo traps for several weeks, and the first snapshots have arrived. Oh. 
Mama bear with a baby, which is not only cute, but for the scientists, it's the proof of reproductive possibilities, even under the most difficult climatic conditions. This gives them hope for the survival of the species, which is sadly at the top of the red list of threatened species. The Gobi bear is slightly smaller than other brown bears, and its defining characteristic is a white spot on the neck. The spot is like a name tag, so we can distinguish between individuals very precisely. The cameras are our most important research tool, because the bears themselves are practically never seen. I've definitely never been lucky enough. Among us biologists, there's a saying, seeing a Gobi bear is as rare as spotting a star in the daytime sky. But who knows, maybe it'll work out this time. The next morning, Professor Samya has discovered a nest in the rock face. Monk vultures have settled here. They'll use it as a starting point for hunting trips and a breeding grounds for their offspring. The scientists' car and tents didn't go undetected by the nomads for very long. We're researchers on our way to the desert. We're looking for Gobi bears. Bears usually live in greener areas, but there are also a few individuals in the desert. What are they like? Have you ever seen one? A Gobi bear? No. I just saw a photo on television. Yeah, I'm not surprised. They are very rare. Our rarest animal in Mongolia. But they do exist, and we're trying to photograph and film them so we can learn more about them. For Professor Samya and Yondon, it's now time to continue out over the bumpy steps to the Gobi. At the same time, the flying garbage collection is going about its daily work. In Mongolia, there's some 3 million people, but 25 million livestock animals, so there's no shortage of food for scavengers. Three days later, the expedition reaches the desert. Extreme heat in the day, and at night, it's often ice cold. Not to mention the sudden sandstorms. Here, the Gobi is an almost endless plain of gravel, occasionally interrupted by sand dunes and bounded by bare mountains. When I came here for the first time, I thought not a single blade of grass could grow here. Everything is dead. But that's not true. There are so many green spots. There are watering holes, and if you look closely, there are animals as well. It fascinates me. 
After all, the Gobi is a huge habitat and not just a frying pan. They are now at the edge of the Great Gobi, a strictly protected area. The entire region is considered to be a gathering point for rare species. But at first glance, nothing can be seen except wasteland, and nothing can be felt except heat. At temperatures of up to 50 degrees Celsius in the shade, only the true artists of survival come out during the day. With well-insulated foot pads and sufficient fat reserves, the rare wild camels are on the move. Smaller ears, narrower humps and longer legs, that's how they're different from domesticated camels. But in the fight for water, the wild animals of the Gobi have rivals. The desert nomads are specialized in adapting to inhospitable environments. <laughs> it's a life of hardship and deprivation. Many nomads have long since left the desert and are trying their luck in Ulaanbaatar. Those who stay in the Gobi preserve the traditions. The frequent change of pastures determines the rhythm of their lives. Just as it was centuries ago, the yurt is their mobile home today, with integrated air conditioning. The multi-layered felt and cotton tent walls resist the heat in summer and the cold in winter. In search of the latest green patches, the nomads move with their animals from watering hole to watering hole. But springs that are occupied by sheep or goats cannot be used by wild animals a fatal cutthroat competition. Even though it doesn't look like it, products for the international market are made here. In the extreme desert climate, the goats acquire especially fine belly hair, cashmere, the finest wool in the world. <laughs> Sug Dalai is a goat herd, like his father and his grandfather before him. Now in spring, it's time to comb out the fluff. In Ulaanbaatar, the cashmere is processed into expensive scarves, jumpers and coats in modern factories. The only real top export of Mongolia the Kashmir goats secure a modest level of prosperity for the desert nomads. <coughs> it's butchering day in Sukdalai's family. The goats have nothing to fear. As wool suppliers, they're too valuable for the cooking pot. A fat-tailed sheep is slaughtered, according to the old Mongolian method. The animal is cut through the throat with bare hands. This is archaic, but not brutal. A quick death and a relatively non-violent slaughtering method. <laughs> Suk Dalai and his mother-in-law, Naranji Meg, are proud desert nomads. Tales of the Gobi bears are part of their everyday life in the yurt. I've never seen a gobi bear in the flesh, but I've seen paw prints. That was over at the spring, but it was a while ago. 
My grandmother told me that she saw the bears a few times when she was small, and there are people who say that its bile has healing powers. I believe it was used for natural medicine, right? But I don't know if that's true. The Gobi bear. Yep, that's a bit of a thing. I saw one once. I was traveling on camels with my brother, and there it lay sleeping on the ground. The roar of the camels woke it up. It raised its giant head, took a look at us, and then ran away. The scientists say that they're threatened with extinction. Personally, I think that the Gobi bears run too slowly to catch their prey. They do have those really short bow legs. On TV, they said that they also eat roots in the desert here. But I can hardly imagine that a, a bear is fully sated with those. In the nomad stories, eyewitness reports are mixed up with legends. City dwellers laughed at the reports of the Gobi bear for a long time as a made-up ghost from the yurts. It was the Mongolian yeti, a creature of fable and definitely not a real animal. Then, in 2001, German conservationist Franz Welleck lifted the veil of mystery. His recordings on film were the first proof that there really are bears living in the desert. Russian botanists had already reported on a Gobi bear at the end of the 19th century. At that time, however, there was a theory that it could be a bear that ran away from a Chinese circus. Or maybe it was a yeti a creature of fable between a human and an animal. <laughs> Professor Samya is on the trail of a legend. In the Gandan Monastery, even as a rational scientist who grew up under socialism, he respects the Buddhist traditions. It took a long time before the monks granted him access to the old monastic library, a treasure of faith and knowledge. Hundreds of valuable manuscripts are stored here. Among them is one of particular interest to the professor. The Old Tibetan Handbook of Central Asian Medicinal Plants and Animals. The book lists hundreds of plants and animals that can still be found in Mongolia, a work of science, not a spiritual treatise. And yet suddenly a yeti emerges. The Mongols call it Hungurus or Almas. Hungurus. Hungarus, Almas, or Gobi Bear. In the end, those are three names for the same creature. I mean, the desert bear was already so rare in ancient times that no one really knew if it existed or not. And so the reports of a bear sighting were rephrased as legends. The artist got it about right. A standing Gobi Bear doesn't look much different. For me, that's not a hybrid creature of man and animal. Rather, it's quite clearly the Gobi Bear as the monk put it to paper with some imagination. The expedition is nearing the finish line. Arrival in the Tsargan Bogd Gobi Mountains, home of the last Gobi Bears. I 
I read in a research report that the bear also eats insects. Is that right? Yes, cicadas. But are there any of those here? The professor responds with proof in the form of a folk song. Through the golden mountains of the Gobi sounds the chirping of the cicada. So the bears have plenty of insects to eat. <laughs> After four days, their destination has finally been reached. Arrival at 1,700 meters of altitude. Bag Tok Tok has been waiting for Professor Samya and Yondon. The doctoral student had to spend the past weeks up here alone. This sounds romantic, but it is not without its dangers. You already look like a bear yourself, says the professor, glad that his young colleague has survived the winter and seems healthy. Bag Tok Tok is lord of the cameras. He'll evaluate thousands of photos and hundreds of video clips for his doctoral thesis titled Survival Strategies of the Gobi Bears. The researchers have installed self-activating cameras at five watering holes to acquire an overview of the bear population for the first time ever. The hut is the bear researchers' base camp. They call it their four-star hotel. <laughs> The cameras get the majority of their work done at night, for at night, the gobi is alive. When the temperatures drop to a tolerable level, the animals venture to the watering holes. A kulan. Decades ago, huge herds of wild donkeys roamed through Central Asia. Today, they are a rarity. Their enemies are also right at their heels at the watering hole. A lynx has picked up the scent. And then the king of the desert animals appears, the Gobi bear, an adolescent male on the prowl, one of the last of its kind. Rendezvous in front of a hidden camera, a snow leopard couple. Endangered because of their skins, which are traded for large sums of money on the black market. Researchers call the Gobi bear an umbrella species. When its habitat is protected, other rare desert inhabitants also have a chance of survival. Working with the cameras is tedious. The watering holes are large distances apart and often located in hard-to-reach valleys. The professor has turned over these motorcycle tours to his younger colleagues. Tok Tok has a practiced eye. He grew up as a nomad boy in the Gobi. His grandfather taught him how to track. Mm, that looks interesting. Look over there. Down there. What have you found? Are those Gobi bear tracks? No, they're too small. They're wild sheep tracks. The tops point west. They were definitely on their way to the watering hole behind the next hill. We have camera recordings from last winter. There was real traffic there, ibexes and wild sheep with many younglings. Ah. 
Those are the only ones that appear during the day, because the predators aren't there. And then, a first sign of bear activity. The droppings are still damp, so fresh, perhaps even from this morning. But we definitely know now that the bear was here. What do we do if it's still here somewhere? Mm, then we have a problem, but that's very unlikely during the day. Look over here. Okay, down there. Bear tracks are coming down from here, you see. They're as big as a small human hand. I think the print is from the back paw. The track is well preserved. It's no older than a couple of hours. And it's deep. So maybe a 100 kilo male on its way to the watering hole? Actually, Gobi bears are not aggressive, but we should be careful. In the spring, when they're with their cubs, we shouldn't risk anything. After a brisk march through the mountains, arrival at the photo trap. The camera is positioned so that there aren't too many plants in the picture, because even the smallest movement of a blade of grass can trigger the shutter. Often, there are hundreds of empty shots on the cards. Researching bears through cameras is a game of patience. Mm. Oh, we're very lucky. There really is one here, maybe two. This looks like a fully grown male, well fed. Could it be the bear from the tracks we saw? That's quite likely. Then we really just barely missed it. Yeah, that's also a good thing. The recordings are invaluable for the researchers. They can observe individual animals for years, determine the population, draw up movement and behavior patterns. For the first time, they've let the cameras run over winter, with some surprises. A snowstorm in the Gobi and a desert bear interrupting its winter hibernation satisfies its thirst on the ice of the frozen watering hole. Laboratory analyses of the dung have shown that the Gobi bear is almost a vegetarian. It feeds mostly on berries and dug up roots. But the Gobi's sparse vegetation can only feed a very small population. With the help of the cameras, we've managed to identify 23 animals. Maybe there are a few more that haven't wandered into our camera traps yet, but we don't know for sure. And even though we document cubs again and again, the population in total is dangerously small. There are also indications that the bears sometimes cross over the border into China, but no one knows if there are really more of them in the Chinese part of the Gobi. Maybe in the end, only professional breeding programs like those for the panda bear will help save the Gobi bear. 
but that's controversial. One thing is clear, however, we're running out of time. The fact that we have bears in the camera traps on our first day is a great stroke of luck. After all, the Gobi bear is one of the rarest animals in the world. It's simply brilliant. For Yondon and Bagtogtog, it was a successful tour to the camera traps. The recordings prove that the bears have survived the winter. Back at base camp, a little evening assignment is waiting for Yondon. Professor Samya wants to set down traps, not for Gobi bears, but for mice. They make up part of the bears' food supply, and therefore it's important to have an overview of the population. The mice are lured with some dry food. And so they can find the traps again tomorrow, they are placed at a distance of exactly 10 steps. Bear research in the isolated mountains of the Gobi, something that can only be accomplished by a well-coordinated team and researchers with quite a bit of idealism. The water is drawn from a small desert spring, and there's not much variety in the menu. Once again, today's dinner is typically Mongolian. Soup with dried meat and burtsog, a kind of fried dough. <laughs> the next morning we check out the mouse traps. The fact that bears catch rodents may sound surprising, but the Gobi bear has a simple survival strategy. It eats whatever it can find. And desert mice are an important source of fat and energy in their largely vegetarian diet. A yellow-tailed Mongolian gerbil, a typical domestic animal that shows up in children's rooms around Europe. The Gobi bear cannot catch it. It's too fast. But it digs up their burrows and pulls them out for itself. <laughs> There are also reports that Gobi bears hunt rabbits, but we haven't really been able to prove that so far. <laughs> Searching for food and water is the main daily occupation for the Gobi bear and poses a real challenge. Some animals were caught by an American researcher and fitted with GPS collars. This allowed them to find out that the Gobi bear travels huge distances at night, searching for food and water. It's the mammal with the longest treks. And that means only in a large protected area and only if the sensitive ecosystem of the Gobi remains free of human influence does the bear still have a chance of survival. How a brown bear can manage to find enough food in the desert at all remained a mystery for a long time. But the answer is simple. Due to a lack of animal food, it has largely converted to vegetarian food. And its favorite thing to eat is the largest edible desert plant. This is wild rhubarb. 
The leaves are so large that the few drops of rain can flow to the root, which reaches deep into the earth. A perfectly constructed desert plant. Does the bear just eat the leaves or the flowers as well? Neither. It digs a hole and pulls the root out of the ground. It's the particularly nutritious part of the plant. This is a very cumbersome way of feeding, but it's also very effective. We have done many fecal analyses and can safely say rhubarb is the favorite food of the Gobi bear. It lived here a thousand years ago when the area was still a humid savanna. We say it's a, a relic from that time. And it has adapted itself perfectly to the changes in its environment. It's slightly smaller and lighter, but also more resilient than other brown bears. But we cannot say what will happen if climate change continues so rapidly. The lack of water has intensified over the past few years. Many springs in the Gobi have dried up. But the direct influences of man are even more threatening. The giant protected areas of the Gobi seem at first glance to be untouched and free of humans. And yet the habitat for wild animals is growing scarce. Whether or not the last desert bears in the world will survive will ultimately be decided by human behavior. Because economic interests are already threatening the national parks from all sides. There are the gold, copper and coal mines on the border with China, which consume a lot of water. On top of that, the road and railway projects, as well as the nomads with their herds of goats that are very close to the protected areas. The population of Kashmir goats has exploded in recent years because their wool ensures a decent livelihood for their owners. And the last watering holes are occupied by these herds. Every morning, there is a traffic jam. Zukdalai is only allowed to go with his goats to the sparse watering hole for 15 minutes every day. We nomads are accustomed to following the pasture and the water, but it has become very difficult here in recent years. I need a large herd to feed my family, but we can barely find enough water. Actually, I would like to have a few hundred animals more, then it would be easier to make enough money with their wool. But if we increase the herds, we'll have even less water. I know that everything my sheep and goats drink is taken away from the wild desert animals. But what am I to do? I cannot let my animals go thirsty. I've already discussed it with environmentalists, but so far nobody has been able to tell me how we should solve this problem. Many nomads have long since left the Gobi to find an easier life in Ulaanbaatar. Dzuk Dalai is holding on. A solar panel provides him some electricity. He has replaced his horse with a Chinese motorcycle. The family is sticking together across generations. His daughter has just gotten a mobile phone, so she can finally stay in touch with her fiancé, who lives 50 kilometers away. No one can predict how long the traditional nomadic life will hold out. The Mongolian state has tried to bring some kinds of progress to the cattle herders to stop migration out of the desert. But this leads to new problems. This mound of earth is a harbinger of modern times. A fiber optic cable has been laid here so that the nomads can also have digital TV and internet soon. For hundreds of kilometers, this new scar now runs through the sensitive ecosystem and cuts into the animals' habitats. (laughs) 
Kulan researchers have found that wild donkeys are extremely sensitive to any disturbance of their walking routes. Roads and railroad tracks are insurmountable obstacles for them. The last outpost of humans in the Gobi is the Shinshinst settlement. There's a warehouse for Kashmir wool here and a boarding school. Most nomad children live here for several months a year and only spend the summer with their families in the yurts. <laughs> Professor Samya and Bagtok Tok have come to the village today because educational outreach work is an important part of their Gobi Bear protection program. You've probably never seen a bear before, but I'm going to show you some today. They're really heavy. They weigh up to 120 kilos. But first, do you know where the bears live? Yes, exactly. They spend the winter in caves. The babies are born at the end of March, and after a few weeks, the mum and her child go out together. Mother bear is very careful with her cubs, just like your mothers take care of you. Do you have any questions for me? Um, teacher, how old can a Gobi bear get? Not as old as us human beings. It lives only about 20 years. It has a hard life in the desert and hardly anything to eat. There are very few left, so we have to protect and love the Gobi bears. Teacher, how big does a bear grow? As big as us humans, at least when a male stands up. Colleagues of mine have measured some Gobi bears. Those were between 1 meter 47 and 1 meter 60 long. The females are somewhat smaller. If you look closely, you can see that their fur is light brown. Other brown bears are darker. So the Gobi bear is something quite unique in the world. And then there's a drawing contest. The assignment, draw the Gobi bears and what threatens them. The children already know a lot about the bear and also that poachers lie in wait for it. I drew this because people should know that you cannot shoot the Gobi bears. This is not about the Gobi bears, it's about the children learning to value nature. So many young people have moved from the country to the city. I believe that only when the children realize that they have the chance to live in a unique and beautiful environment, and that that is quite valuable, will we have a chance to preserve the traditional nomadic life. <laughs> I want the Gobi bear to have a good life. I want it to always find enough to eat. The Gobi bear family should multiply. As a thank you for the visit, the school has thought up something special and invites the bear researchers into the auditorium.
A puppet play with a message. The yak warns the other animals about the evil wolf that wants to kidnap the Gobi bears and sell them to a circus in China. We mustn't allow this. Help the Gobi bear so that it stays in Mongolia. Of course, the play has a happy ending, and for the finale, the song of the Gobi bear is sung. Clumsy bear with bandy legs, you roam through the desert. We wish you a long life, dear Gobi bear. So the children's song goes. It's the final day of the expedition. Professor Samya and Yondon make an attempt to get even closer to the Gobi bears. The camera recordings from the last few days show that it's been appearing regularly at this watering hole. The flattened grass shows where it lay down. A path also leads from the mountains down here. This seems to be one of its favorite places. There's water, insects, and it's shady. And we know that it's hibernated here before. The bear hibernates in the grass in the winter? Yes, but this is the exception. Normally it retreats to a sheltered cave at the beginning of November. But unlike, for example, a marmot, it doesn't really sleep through, but leaves the cave occasionally to drink. In February, they give birth to the cubs. Although the mother bears weigh up to 100 kilos, the baby weighs only 500 grams. Uh -huh. Today is no exception to the rule. As soon as the researchers arrive, the bear is gone. It is not only one of the rarest, but also one of the shyest animals in the world. But there are also animals that don't run away. The petroglyphs at Sagan Bog, rock drawings that nomads made over 3,000 years ago. Immortalized here are many animals that still live in the Gobi today. Wild sheep, camels, and ibexes. This is a wonderful historical document, a mirror of that time. The drawings tell us that humans lived as hunters in the Gobi back then, and that there was a rich variety of animals. Only one animal is missing. That is the Gobi bear. Apparently, it was already so shy back then that humans didn't get to see it. One can say it's remained true to itself. It was already rare at that time, and it is even rarer today. The expedition is coming to an end, but work on the bear protection project continues. When they are back in Ulaanbaatar, Professor Samia, Baktoktok and Yondon will evaluate the recordings from the camera traps. I think everyone who sees this beautiful animal understands that it's our duty as humans to protect it. There are many more animals that should be protected. From this small fly on the lamp to the big bears, we have a unique ecosystem here. Little by little, we are understanding it better. For this, the expedition was important. Even though I still haven't seen the Gobi bear in person yet, but who knows, maybe it will reveal itself one day. I'm not giving up that easily.
The Gobi bear is endangered, but I truly hope it's not too late to save it. This expedition was incredibly exciting for me, and I'll definitely continue to support the professor in his research when we're back at the university.